Welcome. You are listening to Voices of Change on Usula Radio with your host Leslie Acosta and Aisha Richardson. Aisha, we have a special guest today. We do. And I am so happy about this guest. Uh, I, I have like a nostalgic feeling here, you know? Yeah. Signy, you. Yeah. I feel like this is like the grand reunion. It's a three it musketeer is. thing. It is. It is. <laughs> right, Signy? It sure is. Signy, um, amazing. You look amazing. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to have you here uh, on Usala at Usala Radio. You look great. You look like you're doing great stuff in the community. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to get into this discussion and a little bit about reproductive rights. Um, and uh, we have this distinct pleasure. I'm just so happy today. I don't know. I, I feel <laughs> yeah. so happy today. Well, it's good to see I people love being to see su- successful, yeah. right? Very so lovely. as a, from an intern to a staff person to a graduate in the master's degree program in health at Drexel Public Health, so and now, you know, working in, in, the fi- in her field. Yeah. So it's yeah. amazing. It's amazing how yeah. you've come along. I remember Aisha when she came to the office and she yeah. says, you know what? I want to volunteer. Yeah. I was so impressed by that. I was yeah. like, absolutely. <laughs> An educated Latina. Um, yes, I, yeah. we, we were all for that. But, Signe, welcome. Thank you so, so much. So happy to see Thank you Thank you for today. that introduction. And it's just, like you said, really nostalgic to be here. And, you know, you two are like my mentors. Like, I attribute a lot of that success to, you know, you guys, you yeah. know, really being that face. When you have people who look like you, think like you, and you know, are there to hear you out. And, you know, mentorship is an evidence-based practice. Yeah, Absolutely. exactly. You know it's what I mean? It's so, important to you know, have people pushing I'm, you. I'm really yeah. fortunate to have, you know, mentors. Well, I'll tell you, Signe um, is currently working for the Women Medical Fund, and she's going to discuss her advocacy work. Uh, she sits on the board. Uh, and um, in the second segment of this show, we're going to talk about the appointment of Jennifer Storm as a victim's advocate for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And there is some conflict there because she is a leftover from the Corbett administration and her term already has expired. Did, yeah. And we need someone to get appointed to that position. But I don't know what's going on with Tom Wolf. I don't know if he's just already tuned out. You know, he's, I don't know what's going on, but we will be talking about that in, in just a few minutes. But once again, welcome. And uh, we're gonna talk about a very interesting topic today, mm-hmm. very controversial topic, uh, not only here in Pennsylvania, Across this nation Mm -hmm. about reproductive rights. Um, In November 2019, the Republican led General Assembly considered heartbeat bills, actually, three of them. Two are on the table right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, They aim to alter long established medical protocol regarding reproductive rights. Uh, Senate Bill 912 and House Bill 1977. It's modeled, uh, these two bills, they're modeled alter legislation crafted by the Christian conservative group Faith to Action. So they were the ones who actually drafted this bill, and the Republican-led General Assembly is pushing these two bills. And this was in November, so this is recent. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a month ago. Uh, Under current Pennsylvania law, a fetal death is defined by a gestation of 16-plus weeks. As such, they require a fetal death certificate which triggers the need for bureau permit and ritual bureau or uh, cremation as opposed to the remains being handled as a medical issue. The chief among the concerns pertains to the debate over the redefinition of personhood. That's, that's, mm-hmm. the big, that's the big issue here. Critics say the law would impose stringent and arbitrary parameters on the definition of a baby or person. Mm-hmm. Medical experts say the fetal remains bill would roll back the definition of a pregnancy to all gestational age, thus infringing on a woman's rights to conceptualize her own pregnancy. Mm-hmm. What say you, Aisha? What say you, Signe? Let's gonna, talk about that. I'm gonna let Signe go ahead and, and start. Yeah. So I think first and foremost, I think when we're thinking, when we're talking about the, you know, the fetal heartbeat, I think it's really important to really take a step back and think about when on average a woman or person becomes pregnant and when they find out when they become pregnant, right? Right. And it's right around that six, seven, eight weeks Mm -hmm. that folks become, learn that they are pregnant. Um, And so obviously this is not really about, you know, a fetal heartbeat per se, but really trying, like you said, to infringe on that right when how cruel it is mm-hmm. when women and people find out that they are pregnant right around that time. So that's not giving folks time at all to even think about whether they're, they want to terminate a pregnancy 
or God forbid something's wrong with, you know, I, I'm not going to say the word baby, the fetus, you know what I mean? Because to me, a baby is something that can live outside the womb. Mm -hmm. And that is something that you kind of define on your own as someone who wants to have a child. Um, but this is, to me, this has never really been about the choice, right? Because women of color have been disproportionately affected by these laws. White women are always going to have abortions no matter what. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. Um, So I think it's really important to really talk about, you know, I really do take a step back when we say choice because for me, there are so many decisions that go into this for women of color. Um, and the social determinants of health tell us a lot about who gets to have a child and who gets to be a parent, mm -hmm. right? So I think that one of the biggest takeaways with these bills and, you know, while Governor Wolf, you know, we could say a lot about Governor Wolf, but I think we are very fortunate to have a governor who's been so incredibly supportive of a woman's right to choose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he has said through and through, this comes to my desk, I'm going to veto. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's, and, and, you know, thank God that we do have yeah. Tom Wolf, um, who's protecting, mm -hmm. um, if you will, uh, that, that right. Um, the bill, if you will, fundamentally making a statement that early pregnancy loss is, is a fetal death. Mm -hmm. That's a larger philosophical, Aisha, conversation. Yeah. And Signe, and we as a country have not reached a consensus on those issues. We're very polarized on those issues. When you look at different faith-based groups and different women, they all have different conceptions. Mm -hmm. Every single person is different. Um, uh, and they have a different conception of what a child is, right? Uh, Republic, the Republican lawmakers are sneaking a huge statement in this bill that has big legal implications. Bottom line. So House Bill 1890, which is another bill, a uh, heart, uh, heartbeat bill, would require hospitals, abortion clinics, and other providers to file vital records, information of fetal death, and arrange for the bureau or cremation. The bill will, would impose penalties under the law to any medical facility that did not adhere to the provisions of the law, including in some cases up to six months in prison. So we're talking about criminal, criminalizing people and criminalizing women that have the right to choose what they want to do with their body. Right. This is unbelievable. Yeah, and I think that part of this issue has to do with uh, women who are maybe experiencing miscarriage and have the right to decide whether or not they want to have a funeral or they want to continue to move on. I mean, I think that forcing people to do something is inherently wrong. I mean, it's just, and it's yeah. cruel. It's it is incredibly cruel. cruel. It's disgusting. Yeah. Right. And the bill defines fatal death as the expulsion or extraction from its mother of a product of conception that shows no evidence of life after the expulsion or extraction. I mean, these are the kinds of bills that um, are trying to, these are the kinds of legislators that are trying to force people to, um, you know, uh, take ectopic pregnancies and make them into um, pregnancies that are in the uterus. I mean, like, it's right. it's just bizarre. I mean, this is the most politicized issue. It, it and is. I don't even want to say issue, because I feel like this is really not an issue. This is just, you know, the Republican Party and conservatives and, you know, hard. And I don't want to say, like, all Catholics and Christians, because we do have, like, organizations like Catholics for Choice, mm -hmm. um, you know, that aren't reproductive justice organizations, but they really do, you know, they're on the forefront of reproductive rights yeah. in, in, this, in the U.S. But it's mean. It, it's it is. Mean. And it, it's just, it's not about, you know, this whole, oh, you know, this child or can we talk about the, the woman or the person who's carrying? Right, 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 right. Like, I feel like, why does that get lost in translation? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it really does make you question the value that we have in our society. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's very towards the right very yeah. conservative on these issues and there's yeah. a lot of organizations pushing for this and i think this is a slippery slope um issue of of personhood for criminalizing pregnant women and we have to be very careful how exactly. we're moving right. in this direction and mira i'm a, now i'm talking in spanish right <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm talking in spanish. <laughs> now i'm talking in spanish look conception is conception birth is birth right a cardiac activity is one of many milestones in a pregnancy right Right. This line drawn in the sand is arbitrary and hurtful to women since most women don't even know that they're pregnant at six weeks. Right. Ultimately, this distinction just takes away 
the choice of a woman to choose. And politicians should not be in, we're not in the business of telling people what to do with their bodies. That's yeah. not our role. Yeah. And the legislature here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and I remember when I was there, they brought up this bill mm -hmm. uh, and they wanted to reduce it from 24 weeks, which is the law, to 23 to weeks. Um, it's 20. still, that's still pending. Yeah. That, that is not our business to, to tell a woman how to, con what to do with her body and how yes. to do it with her body. Exactly. We're talking about one in four. Yeah. Just do the math. Mm. Right. So obviously we need to be talking about this. I think, you know, for a long time, black women, women of color have been on the forefront of the issue and maybe not. You know, I think I think right now is a really good time for white folks to really step up because yeah. like we've been playing teacher for far too long on these issues. Yeah. Right. And so then that's when that conversation about being an ally versus an accomplice comes in. Um, and I think right now, going into 2020, that's definitely something we need to be pushing for. Yeah, this is like a bizarre way to shame women who want to make their their right to I mean, yeah, a just, miscarriage or an abortion. They're just they're just um, they're. It's almost like it's nuisance legislation, <laughs> you know, designed yeah. to chip away at abortion access and abortion rights. And rather than focusing in on the fetus. Why can't we focus in on postpartum depression? Why can't we focus maternal in on health. maternal health? I mean, you know, we have this issue with um, women of color dying at higher rates after after birth right. than any other, you know, um, per, part of the population. And, we're, you know, like and the U.S. has a higher post-death rate among pregnant, you know, women after they give birth than most um, uh uh, third world countries. Right. So we so we're focusing so much on a non-issue and not focusing and it's taking our are taking our focus away from the real issue which is reproductive health. You know, reproductive health and the whole the full spectrum. So you know, I you know I know these 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 bills are not going to be uh, signed by the governor, but the fact that they take up the legislature's time, it's it's um. Listen, it's abusive. Listen, 41 states are introducing these heartbeat bills. Yeah, well, 41 hundreds states. of bills have been yeah. introduced I mean, since 2016. It's, it's amazing. This, this is a very organized, it, you know, a, a targeted attack. To the Roe versus oh, yeah. Wade. They want to dismantle. Exactly. They when you said chip away, dismantle, this is all the plan to right. attack Roe. And the truth is, conservative or not, we're talking about a vast majority, 72 to 73 so I've seen 72 and I've seen 73% of Americans in the U.S. do not want Roe v. Wade overturned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? So yeah. we need to talk about that and uplift that and yes. everything that we talk about. So right. it is it is kind of, that's what they're going for and we know it and we're not fools and that's why we're having this conversation. Well, well we're going to have to take a short break. We'll be right back. You're listening to Voices of Change on Usula Radio with your host, Leslie Acosta and Aisha Richardson. We'll be right back. Being prepared is a part of who you are, but it's especially important in the case of a disaster. Be informed about possible emergencies in your area. Make a plan that covers where you'll go in an emergency. Build a kit with the things you need to survive. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Start your plan today. Go to ready.gov slash my plan. They call me Maxi, but I prefer Tripod. I was your above average four-legged homie and then wham, bam, minivan. Some people pity me. Now that's lame. I still run, fetch, and swim. And the ladies love me. I'm the ultimate wingman. Just don't ask me to high five. Welcome back. You are listening to Voices of Change on Usula Radio with your hosts, Aisha Richardson and Leslie Acosta. Ladies, we're talking about a very interesting topic here, controversial topic across this nation. Yeah. Here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, a lot of bills being passed or trying to be passed. Um, 
uh, to get uh, to dismantle, if you will. I really feel this is a direct attack um, against Roe versus Wade, but 71 percent of the population across this country is saying no way. It's yeah. not. It's not going to happen. Let's let's talk a little bit about the medical fund, yeah. right, Signe? I mean, yeah. there's a lot to talk about Absolutely. and unpack. Talk a little bit about what the agency does, what's yeah, the mission, um, and what is it that we're trying to accomplish through this medical fund? Yeah, absolutely. So Women's Medical Fund um, in 2020 has been around for 35 years. So we're going to be celebrating 35 years of being, you know, in the Philadelphia area, which is fantastic. Um, you know, prior, I didn't know that abortion funds existed. You know, yeah. we're not the only one. There's a lot of funds throughout the nation. Um but it was something that was really personal to me at the time to get involved in because, you know, I've been very open about having had an abortion and I was in college and I had Medicaid um, through my mom. And so, you know, the Hyde Amendment that was passed in 1976 mm -hmm. forbids uh, federal funding to go to abortion, right? So going back to that issue that I was saying, like, who gets to pay for this? Who mm -hmm. gets to parent? Um, all those questions, you know, I've really tried to differentiate reproductive rights versus reproductive justice, you know. Um, so, yeah, the fund has been around for 35 years. Um, we fund abortion. Very simple, you know, mission um, for poor folks who want to get an abortion and cannot. And the majority of our callers, you know, some of them are mothers already. So there's a lot of misconceptions about, you know, the irresponsibility and, you know, all these issues around, you know, folks trying to terminate a pregnancy. Um, and, you know, the fund is really challenging those barriers mm -hmm. and really having those difficult conversations that for some are difficult, but for us, they are overdue mm -hmm. about racial and economic justice, mm -hmm. right? So we need to talk about racial and economic justice, and that's what the fund is doing. So, you know, on an average day, um, the average a caller will get is about $131. Um, that may not seem like a lot for us. Always, we are always like we can do more. You know, it's all contingent on funding, right. funders that we get. Um, you know, getting out there in the community and making sure we get those donations um, and our big events that we put on as well. So um, I think, you know, when we think about that one hundred and thirty-one dollars, that's make or break for some folks. It is. Yeah. Um, so I think, mm -hmm. you know, I while we're constantly pushing and we're in a world of we need money, I think for me it's really refreshing to see, you know. 131 is make or break. That's yeah. a, you know, Pico. I mean, That's in the winter, breaker there, yeah. groceries, whatever it may be. Um, and so it's really great, you know, to see that. And obviously, you know, there's a high need. And so, you know, one of the really cool things that um, the fund teamed up with this group that did a documentary um, about the fund and about the helpline. Um, and so there's actually an event coming up on at the library. Let me like look it up really quick. And they're going to be showing, it's a short documentary that kind of shows the process, you know, when a caller calls, like the questions that are asked um, and, you know, just the great work that isn't always on the forefront. Like you said, this is for some very controversial. Um, and so it's just amazing to see because folks are Grapping funds, yeah. you know, to be able to pay for this because this will change your life. Yeah. And, you know, contrary to popular belief, you know, m majority, vast majority of folks do not regret making this decision. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but the fund is really great and really personal to me in that sense, because I was scrapping for funds in when I was in college and I was like, mm -hmm. oh, like I have Medicaid. Oh, wait. I didn't even know, mm -hmm. right? So that's like that exposure you get as you go through and navigate a process. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really nice to have, you know, a phone number you can call. You know, while we do service folks in Philly, we do, like, I believe the last numbers I saw, like, there's like 3% that are outside of even mm -hmm. the state. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, to, we have to think about our, you know, bordering state, like Ohio. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of states really close to us. We're going to see, you know, if these bills continue to be passed, we're going to see folks coming to... Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania yeah. um, and so it's really important to think about that when you're talking about funding. Um, but I think that the documentary, um, you know, when I saw it, I couldn't stop crying because it's so real. You know, you're listening to the callers and they already made the decision. These aren't folks that they already made their appointment. So now mm -hmm. it's up to them to scrap those funds. Mm -hmm. Right. So that is a very crucial period of time when folks are scrapping for funds because the later you push, the more expensive that procedure yeah. is going to be. Yeah. Let me ask you, uh, you serve as black and brown people in its majority? Yeah. Okay. And what other services are being provided by the medical fund uh, other than... Counseling. Um, okay. Absolutely counseling. Um, I know there are a lot of conversations about, um, 
you know, whether we would have like some kind of social service arm, um, but definitely counseling, um, you know, especially if folks are not just counseling, but also, you know, it's really important to think about folks who are calling who may be in a dangerous situation. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely trying to link services. Obviously, it's not very public as to who our stakeholders are or what community groups we work with, but definitely counseling um, and making sure people are safe. Yeah. Those are the two things we're really focusing on. So how does the Women's Medical Fund serve as like a convening body to be able to push back against some of the um, legislation or the attacks on uh, reproductive rights? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good so I th yeah, it's a really good question. And I think that, you know, I wish Seneca was here to touch more a little bit you know, on that as a staffer, but I think for me and the work that I've seen is my second, this is going to be my second year on the board, is that we really don't, while we know it is really important to engage with elected officials mm -hmm. and having those, you know, friendly faces and folks that we can call allies, accomplices, what you will, yeah. at the end of the day, this one's going to be here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those dollars, we raise them. Yeah. You know, no yeah. one is going to take that away. These abortions are going to keep happening. Yeah. You want to overturn every rate? Okay, great. We're still going to have folks who are going to perform abortions. Yeah. And you can't um, compromise. Your, your, what you guys do, you know, in exchange for political help, right? right. So, so even though you guys buddy up politically, you have a mission that you have to accomplish. Exactly. And your, and your, and your funding doesn't come from politicians. It doesn't. Okay. Right. right. So that's very, it's a very, again, reproductive justice. I mean, we're... Tackling social determinants of health, I mean, you know, if you look at who's getting an abortion, I mean, black folks are primarily most impacted, um, black and brown folks. And so, you know, this is not, again, not an issue of reproductive rights, but RJ, reproductive justice and that movement and what that looks like. You know, these are folks who are working, are mothers, not working, um, are in a really difficult situation, whether that's domestic violence um, or someone who maybe was raped. Um, you know, issue. you know what I mean? And so these are the conversations that aren't on the forefront, right? Mm -hmm. But we're still having them and mm -hmm. we're gonna keep having them and we're gonna keep raising those dollars to make sure that we, you know, maybe can raise that $131. So I know right now we have a very generous funder for 35 years mm -hmm. um, who is gonna be matching any donations mm -hmm. up to $35,000. So, um, you know, if you wanna donate, that's my plug. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions, Alicia? <laughs> no, I just uh, thank you for the work and, um, you know, thanks to the staff for making you available for the for the interview i think that it's um you know 35 years is a milestone there's a lot of organizations that aren't around um anymore but um this work is critical it's important and um you know i know personally i'm going to continue to support it awesome yeah and i i think you're doing you know the agency itself is doing good work yeah um, here in the city you know we have a lot of poverty here yeah um, and there's a lot of issues. I mean, and to have an agency like that where you can tap into some resources. And I know there's probably uh, a lot of people lined up to get some of these funds, and it's not enough. It's not. It's not enough. It's never so enough. How many people do you guys service, um, uh, would you say, from the agency? Like thousands of? Oh, well, what's absolutely. The what's the percentage? Do you uh, I don't. I've, we're, I'm a little rusty on the numbers there. Um, that's why I wish, I, you know, Seneca was supposed to be joining us. But um, she would be able to polish up on those numbers. But, you know. We're talking the second the helpline opens in the morning till the end of the day. I mean, the, call, the phones are ringing. Um, and that's what, you know, staffers are, you know, tell us, you know, this is, and they're always telling us on the board, like, come listen to the helpline, come hear these phone calls. And, you know, there'll be times where, you know, I really recommend folks to watch the documentary and to go see it at some of the screenings that are going to be available throughout the city. And when is that going to happen? Uh, let me pull that up. So yeah. it's... Um, so there's going to be a film screening January 21st at the library at the Parkway, Central Branch. Okay. 6.30 to 8. I'm going to be there. I'm please, definitely going to Please, please. There's going to be a panel um, and a discussion afterwards. It's really heavy but necessary, yeah. right? It's mm -hmm. very real. And I think, you know, even all the work that we do on the fund, like a lot of folks, we often reflect even as a board, right? When we look at nonprofit or corporate structure, like what do they look like? We need to make sure that we reflect the population that is being affected. And that's being, that's like, absolutely. And that is being served, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we can't have this conversation without black, fo black folks. Mm -hmm. Right. Immigration. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
immigrants, uh, mm -hmm. people of color. Yeah. Um, these are the folks that need to be on the forefront. And so I think out of all the work that I've done, I think this is the one I'm probably most proud of just because it is personal and just because I feel that my personal community, and I don't speak for all of the Latin, Latinx community, really has, to me, in my opinion, have a lot, of, a lot of work to do to really talk about these things. Well, we, we need to be at the table. Exactly. Yeah. And I keep telling Aisha this, we have these discussions here at USALA. Latinos are not at the table. Right. They use our vote. Mm -hmm. They use the clout that we have, a little bit that we do have, to get our votes, but we're not sitting at the table. No. And we have to do a better job in getting our message right in organizing as a Latino community so that when we do come, uh, we have something to offer. And so you mentioned something very interesting. The immigration is part of this conversation, absolutely. Human trafficking, mm -hmm. girls that come from different countries mm -hmm. into this country, where they're raped mm -hmm. uh, coming into this country, uh, they get pregnant, uh, they have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. uh, they're in, they're here illegally. So so your agency reaches out to even women uh, that that go through that tra a traumatic experience. And I can tell you, when I was a social worker, I had the one case that I did have. Um, I specialize in sexual abuse cases. Was one uh, Juanita uh, that she still is in contact with me today mm -hmm. after so many years. She came to this country through human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And we had to connect her because she got pregnant mm -hmm. as a result of her coming through, uh, through uh, 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 being a human trafficker here. Um, we picked her up. Uh, we, we, we helped her. We took her to because she was pregnant. She didn't know who the father was. So those issues are all interconnected. And we Absolutely. have to have services and resources available for people to, to, to connect to those services. So it's amazing to me that you mentioned uh, the immigration piece to that. And let me just tell you, she was a success story, Juanita, today. Um, she graduated from college. Uh, we, we helped her. She was, in, uh, she was in the foster care system. And the lady that uh, she went to as a foster care adopted her. Mm. Um, and she's still living with the lady today. Okay. And so that was one of the success stories that we had as when I was a child advocate social worker. So, yes, that is paramount. Yeah. That, is, that is very paramount to have an agency like that that can help, Absolutely. especially women that come here illegally, that are immigrants that are coming into this country that also have... Uh, that traumatizing experience. Absolutely. I mean, having a child and making that decision is a huge, huge decision. Sure. She that was can, 16 at the time. Yeah, that can really change your life. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, grateful to say that even in my lineage, like being really outspoken about it, if you do the math, you know, I, I always tell people numbers don't lie, you know, look around you. If you're in a room with 100 women, one in four, right? So yeah. just, uh, you know, just be able to do the math and just know. And I think right now is a really good time for us to really be able to talk about this because it's something really overdue in the Latino community. Yeah. Um, you know, and like just how, you know, we keep talking about these bills and antis and folks who are just so, I mean, they hate this. They hate, I mean, I honestly think they hate women and people. Yeah. I really do. I mean, there's no other way to describe <laughs> it. But you know, and, but yeah. you know what? But they are so, you know, the more I read about this, the more I educate myself on this issue. These tactics are not, I mean, a lot of times they win. A lot of times, I mean, it's very strategic. It's very thought out. And, yeah. you know, sometimes, you, you know, you'll walk by and you'll see folks like protesting. And it's like, this is a baby. And it's like, okay. Yeah. Or like, you know, you know, they'll show the pictures of the abortion. It's like a child. Right. And it's like, you know what? Can we just talk about the 94 percent of abortions that happen in the first trimester mm -hmm. where the fetus can't live outside the womb? Mm -hmm. Like, it's up to us to really talk about this, read right. up on it, because if not, you know, you're going to have all these cuckoo for Cocoa Pops people out there Listen, really believing these politicians things. Politicians are not qualified, and I keep saying this, to make philosophical judgments of what a woman should do with her body. No. That's just the bottom line. We can't do that. We cannot infringe on someone's rights. Yeah. That is your right. That is your right to make that decision. And I went, listen, Aisha I, and Signe, I went to a conservative Christian university. I come from a very conservative background. Mm -hmm. And this was an issue. And I went back to Karen University after I had graduated, many, I graduated in 96. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we had this conversation at the table. You know, as a Christian institution, you're going to have women in this institution in this college who will engage, I don't care how conservative the, the college is, they're going to engage in unsafe 
sex. And as a result, they can get pregnant. And as a result, they can have that decision to have an abortion if they choose to. Yeah. Exactly. We cannot infringe on that right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, and it's amazing because I came, I'm a product of a very conservative background. I, I went to a Christian college. And yet I have these progressive views, and I am very proud of them. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that, you know, we were talking a little bit before the show about um, the this issue of policymakers making these detrimental decisions about whole swaths of, of populations. Yes. And so, you know, going did, and doing some research and looking at the sterilization programs that happened in Puerto Rico between 1930 and 1970s, in the 70s. right? And so that so that was USAID, that was government sponsored, it was government funding that made decisions about not when you were going to have a baby, if you were going to have a baby. If you were going to have a baby. Have yeah. So part of this issue really about uh, uh, reproductive justice is about not if, but when. Right. And so I think that, you know, we have to look at the past and we have to look at the injustices of the past and people, you know, w that went through um, the sterilization, they didn't know that people were being, were being asked whether they wanted to be sterilized while they were in labor. <laughs> You know, Could and you so imagine? this issue, and so, but it was women, Mexican women, who who did lawsuits that fought against that and created laws about informed consent, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so it's when women rise up and say, "No, this is the line in the sand," this right? This is the line in the this sand. This is the line in the sand. So, I think that um, while while we're just starting this conversation, I think that the conversation needs to be ongoing. It's a difficult conversation to have, right. yes, but it is is so incredibly worthy because there may be somebody suffering in silence, and right. if you're here and if you could hear our voices, you're not alone. That's it. Absolutely. That's it. And there's many issues. We're going to take a short break. Um, we'll be right back. You're listening to Voices of Change on Usula Radio with your host, Leslie Acosta and Aisha Richardson. We'll be right back. I came out in the 11th grade. Nobody was embracing you. The kids were cruel. It was very difficult to be gay. Not completing high school is more of a social thing than it was an academic thing. And even though all these years have passed, I still had that longing to have my diploma. I have a mentor, Maria, and she convinced me to continue my education. Just never judges. She's a true role model. From the depths of my heart, I thank you, Maria, for being a friend and a beautiful person. No one receives a diploma alone and I'm honored to share this moment with you. Thank you. If you're even considering getting your high school diploma, go get it. You can do it. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Welcome back. You are listening to Voices of Change on Usula Radio with your host, Leslie Acosta. <laughs> and my friend, my dear friend, Aisha love Richardson. I love you so much. And Signe, <laughs> I love you too. Listen, you ladies, I, I just feel so good today. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, we're having such a great conversation, um, you know, and, you know, getting this information to the public square, right? That's so important. And Signe and you know, you guys are a wealth of knowledge. I like this stuff because mm -hmm. we're really empowering people and you empower people through information. Right. And so you have some information that you want to give us in terms of the phone numbers, right? Where people yeah, can get, absolutely. They can so reach. one of the things I would definitely want to say is, you know, follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, um, make sure that you're following up on our events. We have events. We partner with folks to have events. We have, you know, fundraisers that are coming up. Definitely keep up on those. Because um, it's always, like, really great to just, you know, share space with folks who are in this, right? And so one of the things I like to say is, you know, I, I always send Aaron, um, we get these emails, like, hey, like, we got this person who 
really needs more money because, you know, she had a complication mm -hmm. or what have you. And so the, these emails will come out if you're on our e email list and it'll say, hey, like we need additional funds today. Right. Oh. So you'll get those emails. Um, and so I'll forward them to Aaron. I'm like, this is your time as a white person <laughs> to do. No, for right. real. Yeah, like yeah. You, yeah. we need your money. And yeah. also like, you know, and so I always tell them like, this is your, this is the time for you to really, you know, donate, um, you know, put your money where your mouth is, yeah. you know, and definitely walk the talk um, on all four fronts. So definitely keep up on the events that we're having. Um, the helpline number is 215-564-6622. Again, that's 215-564-6622. Um, they're open Monday through Friday. Yeah. Aisha, you were mentioning something right before our break. Yeah. Where you said, you know, movement of women mm -hmm. in this country mm -hmm. changed a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, beginning from the suffrage movement in the 1840s, mm -hmm. where women stood up and they uh, were fighting to have equal rights, mm -hmm. uh, voting rights in yep. the 1920, yeah. uh, we see in the 1960s. So we see an evolution yeah. of women standing up when there's hard core issues like this, yeah. including um, the impact of the 19th Amendment as a result of the suffrage movement, of the women's rights rights to vote, that we see that translated into the 19th Amendment. Yeah. And so if we, we, we see that trajectory of women standing up when we have hard issues like this. Yeah. This, the same thing with this. Exactly. We need to stand up as a force, as women, to say, no, you're not going to dictate. Men are not going to dictate to us, especially men, because you, you see more men. You see conservative women doing this. But men. A lot more men yes. trying to impose and infringe yeah. on what we want to do with our bodies. That is absolutely wrong. You can't do that. Yeah, so 19, that. 2020 will be the 100th anniversary of, of the, the 19th Amendment. Mm -hmm. And there are, actually I was at a, a, a community meeting that talked about a number of, of um, activities that are going on that celebrates women's suffrage, but also celebrates the passing of the 15th Amendment, which gave African Americans the right to vote, That's which right. was um, in uh, 100, 150 years ago. So the 15th and 19th Amendment are celebrating their 150th and 100th oh. um, anniversary. Yeah, so, so there's this intertwined um, movement around um, African American women and voting rights, but also um, the, uh, so Brandywine work, Brandywine uh, Museum is doing some stuff, the library is doing some stuff, um, the, uh, the Women's um, Commission, the Mayor's Women's Commission is doing some stuff, and um, I, you know, I'll make sure you guys get a copy of it. But it's really interesting that we have this um, issue of suffrage and reproductive justice, yeah. you know? Like, I think that these things are intertwined, yep. and I think that it will be women who are really putting their bodies on the line to, set, to say, to push back against the, the, the attack. Because we're under attack. We're not the ones Absolutely. doing the attacking. Absolutely. We just we just want to have the the choice. We just want to have the ability to make decisions for ourselves and our families. It's other people that are attacking our ability to just be. So yeah, um, this issue of reproductive justice and and rallying around women and and having our voices be raised to say no, no more, no more. Just yeah. you know what? It is what it is, and stop making these abusive pieces of legislation that attack our fundamental rights. Yeah, and it's an abuse. And it's an abuse of power. It is. It is. You can't take your power as a politician and, and, and beat us over. You, right. can't, you can't do that. And Pennsylvania is very conservative. It is. And Pennsylvania has a tendency, because it's a Republican le legislature, uh, to be abusive yeah. in their power. And everything, and yeah. everything, whether it's women's rights, whether it's um, mandatory minimums, whether it's uh, having a gun, owning a gun, and uh, gun control, all of that, they use their power mm -hmm. to limit what people and have people having a voice to make that choice and to make that decision. Absolutely. I want to ask you ladies a question. Um, and this is the other side of the argument, and I'm going to play the devil's advocate here. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Sign Sign are you ready, Signy? <laughs> Signy. They say that a heartbeat does not, actually the heartbeat, the fetus does not yet have a heartbeat until after six weeks of gestation. Right? That's one side of the argument. The other argument is, yeah, 
that th that it's that the heartbeat heartbeat exists at the point of conception. What say you about this? Because this is the central argument. This is the central argument to get this. Yeah, I th these mean, pieces of legislation. Well, I mean, I think that across the finish line. That, that that's the, the the argument is that I am you know as as a in the you know the advocate <laughs> for these abusive. Uh, pieces of legislation I'm advocating for the fetus who no one else is advocating for <laughs> but but the pro but the issue is that that fetus is contained within my body right so I am the best one to decide what's best for my body right so so um you know I think that that I think that is twisted but it's, it's saying that they don't ha that they say that the heartbeat is a game changer and it does not have an impact on a woman's or on a, on a Look, patient at all. Leslie, these are the same people that they say that I'm you know saying. women and children are not are gonna we're gonna um, you know reduce your access to SNAP <laughs> and food stamps, right? Yeah. These are the same people that you know um, in in Pennsylvania, just in the third senatorial district, seven thousand three hundred and five people are going to lose access to to food stamps. So so these are the same people that are advocating for over women's bodies who are don't want to feed them well yeah and well, i mean so if you don't if you're not if you you know like if you don't want to i don't know go this ahead this whole conversation about like what's living and what's not i mean just to be a little bit you know i'm going to say it are we going to like what about men who you know Come on, masturbate Sydney. or whatever. Are we going to have like, that's a live, like yeah. semen is like live, yeah, you know what I mean? Exactly. Like, are we going to have, right. I'm, right. I'm just saying, like, right. are we going to have a burials? Pillow tests, right? Uh, yeah, like, tests. I don't understand. We're going like, to, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna start I you, mean, like, what putting is your sock in a coffin. A <laughs> uh, yeah. A heartbeat doesn't mean uh, living, you know what I mean? I like, think, I think we need to get Signy on the house floor. I know, I know. <laughs> You know what? We Sydney, should bring a sock. We should. You know what? That's that. Our whole campaign should be around socks, right? Like, just take a bunch uh, of socks up to the to, to the state capitol and just and throw say, them and on the house. It, throw them on the house floor and be like, like put that in a coffin, biatch. You know, it's like it's like you know they think they're so smart with this. Oh, the heartbeat. You know what I mean? Yes. And it's like, all right, you want to talk about like, okay, heartbeat does not equal life. No. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So I, I'm, just I'm just putting saying. it out there, you know. No, I mean, but you bring an interesting point. Yeah, thank you, Sig. Thank a Aaron, you. are you listening to this? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're burying all the babies in the semen, you know what I mean? Like, but, come on. Well, and it's true. It's true, you know, because I mean, and that that shows, I mean, I hate to say it, but it shows the ridiculousness of it. That it's you, bizarre. It it's is crazy. Bizarre. It is. It's bizarre. Yeah, yeah. And and so they they couch their their um their concern yeah. For something that is not real, it's just not not a real thing, you yeah. know. And so the the this this issue of repro again going back to reproductive justice means being able to control and make those decisions for yourself and not. Ha I mean, the government they don't want the government to, to take their guns. Why is it that you're trying to take people's Babies, a right to choose, right, 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 and to right choose. to choose. We have to take a short break. <laughs> oh, ladies, uh, we'll be right back. You're listening to Voices of Change on Usula Radio with your host Leslie Acosta and Aisha Richardson. We'll I'm be right sorry. back. What do you think you're doing, Kevin? I uh, was just gonna drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? Oh man, the selfies. <laughs> Selfie nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not okay to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on man, let's put a ride home. Because of you, I feel not alone in this world. And you let me know that it only takes one person to make you feel wanted.
Welcome back. You are listening to Voices of Change on Usula Radio with your hosts, Aisha Richardson and Leslie Acosta. Ladies, <laughs> <laughs> Signe, you made an interesting point and a logical one. A very, I'm just following the logic. The, that's a very logical response to this issue of you know, men trying to impose, or the legis Republican le legislature across this country trying to impose and infringe on our rights to choose, right? So mm -hmm. you made a very logical argument on that, and I'm, I'm proud of you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know what? At the end of the day, the whole point is to restrict and marginalize people with uh, uteruses and abortion providers and force people to stay pregnant. Force people yeah, to stay yeah. pregnant. They want to govern women's bodies when they are pregnant and put people in jail. Yeah. In jail. Are you kidding me? What the hell's going on with this country? What they are saying is we've decided what you should or should not do when you are pregnant, including not carrying the pregnancy at all. Well, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen. Not that I, It's not happening. Lawmakers need to cease imposing religious... Veiled political interference on reproductive health care in Pennsylvania, period. They have no yes. business doing this to us. What say you, ladies? To end this conversation, we're going to go in another conversation in a few seconds. Yeah, I mean, I think that, like I said, I think that this is going to keep happening. I mean, they're going to keep trying, whether or not we have a conservative president or not. I mean, this happens all the time. Obviously, it's amplified when we have someone like Trump in office. I don't even believe Trump believes this stuff. I don't even know. I don't even think this man, honestly, I don't even think he cares about this stuff, <laughs> this stuff Aisha. I really no. don't. I, I think he has, to, he has to speak to the audience that he's catering to because he needs these votes. But I don't even think this man even cares about this stuff. Who knows? Yeah, I, I mean, it's. I don't even really want to get into his head, to tell you the truth. It's, <laughs> it's icky. Yeah, it um, is. But, but I do know that we, we have to continue to uh, make sure that we go out and vote. Yeah. Because every vote matters and that we have to make sure that we are showing up um, when it comes time to speak up for ourselves um, because we have, as women of color, taken abuse in lots of different forms. Yeah. And this is another form of abuse and we have to call it out when we see it um, because that is the, the real issue that we have a legislature that is not representative. It's mostly white men. And, um, you know, it's Republican controlled. And so it's the laws that are being um, drawn are reflective of that. And mm -hmm. the laws that are being heard are reflective of that. And so when we get out and vote and we bring a diverse representation to our legislature, then we get the uh, legislation that's fair. That's fair for yeah. all people. Well, that's, uh, that's exactly right. We're going to switch gears here for a minute. And we're going to talk about the victim's advocate um, that was appointed by the Gor Corbett administration. She's yeah. a leftover. She's still there. Um, Aisha, you have your issues with uh, uh, the victim's advocate, yeah, right? Um, yeah. What? Tell us a little bit well, about I think, Jennifer. I think, I, I think Jennifer that, Storm. Yeah, Jennifer Storm was appointed by the Corbett administration um, as a victim's advocate, and She's a holdover from that Republican administration, and um, her term has actually expired, so it's time for uh, the governor to appoint someone new. And I think that given the diversity of the state, we need to have a victim's advocate that can hold incongruent ideas in their head. Right. And, understand, and, and be fair, right? Across and be the fair. Board. And yeah. understand that perpetrators of crime are also victims of crime. Um, you know, when you go to... But that's a slippery slope, Aisha. It is. And we it have is. to be very careful with that issue, um, you know, because there's people who, very, who are very passionate on both sides of the argument. Right. Right. And you're right. You know, we have to be fair across the board. Well, the, but the other thing is that, you know, we have a criminal justice system that was created hundreds of years ago. It's, that's the, our reality. But, you know, as we have evolved as human beings, our criminal justice system needs to evolve as well. And so we need to start looking at things like restorative justice. And common things sense. That, stuff and that's common, common sense. sense stuff. Because if we don't, we'll continue to have this high rate of violence in our, in our society. And, and incarceration in our society. And incarceration. So yeah. what was different? Um, in the 1970s is d that is different in the 2000s. You know, I mean, in the 1970s, we had uh, 12,000 people incarcerated in our um, criminal, in our state's facilities. Now, now we have 47,000. Yeah, 50, 50, yeah. Well, um, 
I tell you what, we've concluded this segment. I know we, we, a good conversation, and when you're having a good conversation, time just time fl flies very quickly. But it was such a pleasure yes. to have both of you here, yeah. um, especially Signe. You have to come back. I definitely uh, you will. You have a lot to There's contribute lot to, to the Latinx yeah. community. And we, I love your voice. I love your passion. And I love what you're doing uh, here in the city of Philadelphia, uh, the advocacy that you're doing on that front. So thank you for being Thanks here. Thanks for having me. And always good to see you. And yeah. we have to go. You're listening to Voices of Change on Usula Radio with your hosts, Aisha Richardson and Leslie Acosta. We'll see you next week. Thank you.